Hello, I'm Devin, and you're listening to Tools and Craft. Today, I'm talking to Shar Styles, a computational artist, educator, and programmer. I'm excited to talk to Shar because she works at lower levels of computation systems in a way that's very different from most programmers. She approaches it in a highly aesthetic, intuitive way that reframes what those tools are for. Another reason I'm excited to talk to her is that live coding is a niche but rapidly expanding art form, so the tool set is also rapidly evolving to meet the needs of those artists. Shar has made tools for herself and for the broader live coding community, and I'm excited to ask her about all of that. Finally, I'm also looking forward to asking Shar about all of her fun, quirky projects that demonstrate that software's capabilities are a lot broader than most programmers take advantage of. So Shar, thank you so much for taking the time to chat. Thanks, David. I'm so excited to be here. So, so to get started, our listeners may not be familiar with some of the things that you do or even what live coding is. So can you start by defining some terms such as like what is GPU coding and what is live coding? Yes. So what live coding is, is it is a way to perform writing code. So um, usually there's someone who will code the music and someone will code the visuals. And as they do so, they actively change a live document to recompile the code continuously. And their code is displayed uh, for an audience to see. So there's this like one-to-one correspondence. You see the code that is being uh, written, that is being that is creating the music and the visuals that you see. And these performances usually happen at events that we call algo raves, which is a portmanteau of algorithm and rave. I love that. And yes. I haven't <laughs> heard that term before. Yeah, right? It's really neat. I, I really like it too. It was coined by Alex McLean actually 10 years ago to this, to this around this time because we're having like a 10-year anniversary. Um, but the, so the specific type of live coding that I do is shader coding. And shader coding is a way to write a program on directly on your GPU. So I'm writing code that is being run one time per pixel, 60 times a second. And so like, let's say you have like a regular like HD screen, that piece of code that I'm like writing and it's continually compiling is being compiled over 100 million times a second. So this shader coding is usually used in all things real-time graphics because of its power because it's being it, it can be run one time per pixel for 60 times a second this allows you to have like great power to to create real-time experiences so the kind of like de facto example of popular shader uses in video games so almost all 3D video games i say all 3D video games use shaders in some way Um, And I just use it for making interactive abstract art. That is really cool. I I watched some of your live coding performances on YouTube, and I noticed that you project your code up on the screen as well as the graphics that you're creating. Besides the fact that it looks super cool, like why do you make that aesthetic choice? I really believe in uh, developer transparency and being able to be really vulnerable with the uh, s- process of coding, including the errors and the slowness and the uh, frustration and basically just like the human components of of programming. And I know that it isn't necessarily the most like efficient way to expose someone who programs maybe like a most efficient way would to just be to sit someone next to me and just kind of explain everything. But I think that any type of like exposure, even through dance and music is a way to, I guess, recontextualize programming and anything. Basically I'm a huge like advocate for demystifying computation. And so just seeing like, you know, seeing me as a person as I am, just programming and showing the the code as I program, showing my screen, I think is a really powerful thing for me to do, especially because I (laughs) get really shy on stage. (laughs) And so this was like a way for me to be able to share share my process and share my code and kind of get over this fear too. One of the descriptions that I read that you, that you gave about what live coding is, is like, uh, you know, you're coding a graphics program where everyone can see the process. They can see your body language as well. Um, and that's really interesting because it like, usually the way we interact with software is it's on our phone or it's on our computer. We have no idea who made it. We have no idea what it was like to make it. And uh, it's just really hard to empathize with that person, which 
means in turn, it's hard to imagine yourself making that thing. Exactly. Yeah. And I want to kind of loosely quote uh, an artist, Melanie Hoff. She talks about teaching like computation in an artful way. She says, what if the person who wrote the code loved you? What would that code look like? What if you loved the person that wrote the code uh, that, that we're using today? That's very interesting. How would software be different if all programmers took that to heart? Oh, wow. It would be so different. I think there would be there would be less, you know, dark patterns. There would be less kind of, um, uh, I guess, like sh- sh- uh, shuffling. There would be more empathy in the code and in, in your experience. I firmly believe that there would be a not one source of of um, like there would be less basically sorry <laughs> I'm like kind of stumbling over this but basically I think that if all programmers coded with with love and intention there would be less centralization there would be more personal experiences and more tailored experiences on smaller scales more ros- rhizomatic maybe it's a little bit more like uh, I guess dispersing, but I think that it's honestly, I think scale is something that is kind of an antithesis to, or like being like a huge entity is kind of like an antithesis to uh, com- like computing with love because love is, is, is a intentional action and it's hard to tailor that to any specific person if you're just trying to create this broad experience. One of my favorite essays that I actually just reread this morning is called "An App Can Be a Home Cooked Meal." Yes. And the I, have you have you read this essay? I haven't, but I just love that. I love that terminology. That's I, I always think about coding as cooking. That's exactly the metaphor in this, yes. and it's like it's basically saying like when we tell people you should learn to code, we implicitly are saying like you know you should learn to code because it will be good for your career. You'll get good jobs, whatever, which is a totally valid reason to do something. Um, but then, you know, if you say, oh, what if you were to learn how to cook? Mm-hmm. You're, most people are not implying, like, you should go become a chef. You could do that. But that's not really what most people say when they're learning how to cook. Yes. It's, it's more like, I want to learn how to cook so I can make something for my, my mom. I can make something for my husband, my, you know, what, whatever it is, um, someone that you really love. And it's, it's much more of a, a gift that you're giving to somebody or you know, di- different contexts or, or just to be healthy, you know? Oh my gosh, yes. And also another way that this, this is a, such a great analogy. Another way that this extends to food is that we consume things that people code every day. Right now, using the computer, we're consuming code in a way. And I also like to think about it in the way that like in Ratatouille, where that like main chef guy is like, anyone can cook. That's the way I feel about code. It's like anyone can code. Um, and it's just something that like, it, it is such a personal journey and a personal experience. And the way that you approach learning to code should be as different as the people who are doing it. So I think there should be so many different routes into learning how to code. And as of like right now, there's there's really kind of like a definitive path that is kind of recommended for you to learn how to code. And I think part of like my work is that I really want to create these alternative routes into learning tech if you so desire. <laughs> yeah, that is that is really interesting. One of my favorite educational theorists is uh, Seymour Papet. And he, he pushed back against the framing that a lot of people give of like, you know, I'm not a math person. I can't really learn math. And he sort of, th- th- there's this quote he has where he's saying like, you know, yeah, sure. People in math class often don't really learn math, but it's also true that if you are in French class, you're not really going to learn French. But we don't say like, you can't, you don't have the aptitude to learn French. You say like, oh, they didn't grow up in France. Um, and so he has this idea of like, what, what would it look like to, to create like math land, like a place where just everything around you is sort of, it has math embedded in it. And you're just kind of coming across it in a lot of different diverse ways over the course of your day. Like you would probably learn math much more intuitively, just like how you learn French when you're in France. That's, is that something that you think about in the context of, of live coding? Oh my gosh, yes. <laughs> I love this so much. So I'm going to backtrack a little bit. Remember how I was talking about how GPU code is this like very powerful, like, you know, function that, or very powerful program that is run, you know, 100 million times a second. Um, the kind of 
drawback to that is that you have to speak more like a computer because you're working at this super low level. The code is has to go through less layers of abstraction to get the result on your screen. And so the language of computers is math. So you basically are just working with linear algebra, like trigonometry, the kind of like, it's, it's a lot more math involved than like uh, normal programming. So because the input is the pixel coordinate, so the X, Y position, and an output is the red channel, green channel, and blue channel. So you're basically just writing a big function that is input as a Cartesian space and an output is a um, uh, color channel. So, and, you know, using this very, very limited, very hard creative restraint, uh, you use math to kind of expand that out and to create different, create different features throughout space and time and so I think about this all the time when I'm when I'm GPU coding, when I'm writing shaders. I think about how this is such a fun way to learn math. Like, for example, like when I was learning like dot product in linear algebra class, you know, you learn about dot product because like, oh, it's learn it to have a visual outcome that like the strength of the color on your material is directly corresponding to the dot product of the normal to that surface and the angle of the light. And let me just quickly define what a normal is. It is given the on, on a surface of an object, of a 3D object, the normal is a vector that is perpendicular to the uh, to an instantaneous spot on a surface. Sorry if that was like a little bit too much. It's kind of hard to like, you know, just like I said, it's kind of hard to like think about it without a visual. I'm a very visual person, so I wish that I could. <laughs> no, it reminds me a lot of like I, I practiced uh, classical guitar when when I was younger. And uh, I remember when we started learning fractions in school, I had this moment where I was like, wait, four quarter notes is just like the same thing as like how one quarter times four equals one. Like this, it's the same thing. And so I just kind of, I, I remember breezing through that part of the math class because it was just like, oh yeah, I've, I've been doing this for years. Like this is no big deal. And I could like think about it musically. Um, and that was, that was really nice to be able to connect it to something I actually liked uh, as opposed to math, which is it usually feels so abstract in school. Oh my gosh, yeah. It's like they, they talk about, they, they, <laughs> they go through the effort of making up scenarios that will never <laughs> happen so that they can teach you these like super abstract concepts when there are in fact extremely concrete examples of like, yeah, of, like fraction stuff. It's not like, you know, if like, t- you know, the, app, the classic of like Timmy has like 12 bananas and 13 apples and then like takes both of them. It's like, why do you have 13 apples? It's like literally just take a little bit of creativity and think about like what, what's like 13 of something that you would have anyways <laughs> right and also how yeah. can you connect it to something that people can like feel and like have um, emotions about like yeah. music is a perfect example oh my gosh, of that yes. I recently started this learning music I haven't really been putting anything out because um I I am still very much in my like absorbing phase but this is like the I'm so excited about learning music and learning about like the fifths and like power chords and like all this stuff. Cause exactly what you're saying. It's just like another application. Well, it's not just another application, but I'm sure like very music theorists are probably like cringing at me saying this, but I'm like just seeing parallels to like math and music. As I, <laughs> I, I'm just such a baby in the music world. And when you said you study classical guitar, I'm like, Oh my gosh, it's so cool. But I'm also like, I hopefully I'm not like saying like things that are just like grating your ears. <laughs> no, it music is one of the reasons why I always liked math in school. Cause that there were so many connections and I could like think about like, okay, what can I predict about this? Or it made math like rhythmic basically. And I could like feel it in my body as opposed to just abstractly being like, okay, I guess we got to add up these, ba- these bananas or apples or whatever. <laughs> right. Another, another aspect of um, learning that I think can be really helpful is to look at the same problem from like a different angle. Are there any like other mathematical concepts that you maybe didn't intuitively understand as well when you were studying them in school, but um, you like picked up much more quickly once you started writing shaders. I think another one is just cross product. Um, I know like it's very similar to dot product, but a cross product, I learned it really well because you can use it to compute the frustrum of a camera in a ray marching shader. So 
let me kind of backtrack a little bit. Ray marching is a way of writing a small renderer inside of a single shader. So that means that given, I'm going to say this like again, I always, I teach a lot of shader workshops and I always try to like hammer it in like my students has the input is the pixels position and the output is a color. So given just this, this restraint, you can actually create a 3D world. Um, and how you do that is that you get, so you get your like, you know, your 2D position, you, you just start pretending that that is a window into a 3D world and you create a camera in 3D space by just starting to use vector threes. So that's a red, uh, X, Y, Z coordinate instead of just an X, Y. You just like add a third dimension and then you just all like, you just, just start pretending it's 3D and then all of a sudden it is 3D. Um, so when you add this third dimension, you need to create a, like a camera frustrum and, a ca and, like, um, and like perspective from when you cast your pixels out into the 3D space to then return its color. So uh, ray marching, it's called ray marching because you just pretend your pixels are casted out from this camera frustrum into 3D space. The 3D space is defined by what I'm just going to refer to now as like, you don't have to like understand it, but basically um, it's like a black, kind of like a black box. And I'm just saying this now just so we can kind of continue forward. But we use this thing called sign distance functions, which are, you can just believe me when I say that they return, they describe a 3D scene using the distance of a pixel's position to the distance of the surface of the object. So, just to reiterate, so we have pixels casting out into this into this 3D scene that is constructed by sign distance functions. And the pixels are basically returning the color of the object that it hits as if it was a light ray. And funnily enough, I always like to relate this to, so Plato thought that that's how vision worked. He thought that eye feelers were cast out of your eyes and landed on objects and would touch the objects. And then your eye feelers would come back into your eyes and tell your brain what's out there. It is theorized that that is the reason why soldiers salute when they see their general. It's because their eye feelers, the general's eye feelers are so strong, they must protect their eyes from the, from the strong general's eye feelers. Anyways, back to... <laughs> Back to ray marching. So um, ray marching is kind of like this, is kind of like emissive, like if emissive theory, emission theory was was true. And so it's like, instead of calculating every single ray that comes from a light source and then just com and then just rendering the ones that hit your, your camera, you do the opposite. You compute every single light ray that comes from the camera source and then you return like the color of the of the pixel from that light from that eye feeler. Also, um, they eventually to go back into like Plato, why Plato was they figure how they figured out that Plato was wrong was that they said that oh when they found out that stars were really far away they were like this doesn't really line up <laughs> because like when you look at up at the stars you see them immediately the, you, your eye feelers don't don't you don't have that delay so anyways that was just to kind of wrap up that fun fact. <laughs> That's really interesting how like um, you're, you're turning a pretty mathematical concept into like a, a, a metaphor, like a more, yes. more of a, a narrative or a story of like, okay, imagine that you have these eye feelers that go out and do this, um, which I find to be like a much more helpful type of description of how something works than like, uh, I don't know, you could have probably described it in terms of like coordinates or sort of, abstract notation or something that might be more precise and it has its place and the computer the computer likes to hear that but it's uh, not as natural for most people to, to think about especially if you're like uh, approaching a concept for the very first time exactly yeah I am a huge advocate for for making it for prioritizing fun over the accuracy the exact like minute details or, or whatever um but yeah, that's my that's my long winded way of saying I learned how to compute a camera frustrum through cross product. <laughs> when when you teach workshops, have you found found that there are people who like coming into them have said like oh, I'm sorry, I'm not a math person, and then going out have been like, oh, you know, math is actually kind of fun. Oh my gosh, yes, I feel like that's so many of my students, especially because like I I really hold their I really like to hold my students' hands as, as we go through it, um, and I. And I really relate it back to like where a lot of people 
had their math education kind of cut off is high school. And that's, that's really where I like to, to pick, to pick up. And so, you know, I'll reference things like, like, um, you know, that, that we were taught in high school to my math classes so that, so that they don't feel left behind because it's so easy to quickly feel super left behind or have no frame of reference when you're learning, you know, math, math concepts again for like the first time in a lot of, in many years. A lot of my students are programmers and designers. And it's funny that the programmers, like, yeah, like programming, you don't really have to you don't really encounter linear linear algebra and trigonometry a lot in programming. So it's it's really like a, everyone's kind of like, even though it's a one one room schoolhouse, it is I'm able to kind of hone in on like what the general designer and programmer's knowledge is in math. And yeah, I love it when students have a newfound or even like just a very strong want to learn more about math. That's that's one thing that I, I see again and again is that students are like, I see how learn knowing math is applicable here and it's really motivating for me to learn more. And that's why in my like going forward section in my workshops, I always include like three, three, uh, what is it? Three bl- brown, one blue, which is like a YouTube channel. Maybe it's the opposite, but that is a great YouTube channel for uh, anyone listening. I love it. That's it does such a good job of making math actually beautiful, both both like visually beautiful, but also pulling out the the lyricism of it as well. Mm-hmm. How how did you first come across GPU and shader coding? Gosh, oh, that's a great question. I honestly, I was just googling around. I was just traversing the internet, surfing, <laughs> surfing around, and I kind of came across it. And, and I thought, oh, this is like something that it really makes sense to me. It kind of was like an, a click, click moment where I was like, this is, uh, this is really what I want to do. And the reason was because I was lucky enough to be studying computer science and fine art in my undergrad. The, the two combined together just made a lot of sense. And I'm also like a very, um, I'm very scrappy in a way that I like to utilize everything that I have at hand. And so I didn't want to just do art and I didn't want to just do computer science because I was learning both. And so I was like, how can I combine them and be like resourceful? (laughs) Um, And GPU coding just made a lot of sense for that. And I was just like, really, I I think I was also really drawn to the difficulty or the kind of mystery around it. Because a lot of folks will just say shaders are wizards on your computer and you don't need to know exactly what's happening or rather, like, you don't, th- that's kind of like where your knowledge, where like, t- people say, like, you know, that's where my knowledge stops is that like, you know, there's just wizards that, that on the GPU computing pixel magic. Oh, interesting. So w- would it be correct to say that like, a lot of people who do GPU coding, don't really have that much of an understanding of what's going on in the computer, or, or they're not that interested in it? I think it's more that GPU coding and shader programming is very uh, ubiquitous, so that people who are normally doing, um, you know, game development or any kind of like 3D or video stuff, they the shaders are always kind of there and looming over you because they're just they're in all sorts of of any type of visual real time graphics. I really believe that anyone who sets out to learn shaders can definitely learn it. <laughs> yeah. What was your immediate first time? Who, like, this was, like, his main thing. And he was, like, signed on, like, PC music. His name is, like, Little Data. Really, really nice person. But I was so nervous because it was my first algorithm. And I was kind of, like, thrown in, not thrown in the deep end, but I just had this, like, great opportunity to, like, be playing with people who do this a lot and have their, like, you know, have it be, like, their, their main practice. And I remember he, like, comes up to me and he's, like, what's happening here? And, like, you know, kind of, like, quizzically, like, you know, being like, oh, what are you doing? And I was just like unable to like process a human conversation and to like be writing shader code at the same time. And I was like, (laughs) and just completely like, I think I just kind of just like brushed him off. (laughs) But it was, it was a, it was a very thrilling, the whole thing is very thrilling. And I, I think my, my uh, stage fright really kept me going because I would, it's, it's kind of like you get, it's kind of like riding a roller coaster in a way. (laughs) That is, uh, I think, a different experience than most people have with stage fright, yeah. which is like they, they want to get away from it as soon as possible and never do it again. But, but yeah, once you frame it like, yeah, it's like a roller coaster. What's what's the worst that can happen? You're not going to die. So Yeah, <laughs> I guess a roller coaster is a little bit more scary in that case. <laughs> so when, when you first started, what tools were you using? And then how have those evolved? Mm, yeah, so when I first started, I was using... 
my first like uh, show that wasn't necessarily like live coding, but it was my first visual show. I was using just series of pre like pre made shaders. I wasn't coding the shaders necessarily, but I was calling them in functions, and I had like a JavaScript wrapper. And it, I was it was really hacky because I didn't know what I was doing. So it was a 3JS project that had a bunch of different shaders kind of lined up. And then I had a program that would apply the different shaders at different times. And I, I opened the console, and then I would just call the different functions via the console. Um, and then it, it evolved. I used um, Atom. And the first live coder editor that I used in a performance was GLSL dash live coder by Takayoshi Amagi. And it was made in like 2017. And that's when I was like using it. And uh, it was a, it's a great tool. It did get, I do not use that anymore. I use this other tool called Code Life, which is a tool made by Hexler, who made OSC, which allows for a lot more nuanced input. So you can input like audio or video or a noise, noise field. So I use a combination of that. And my also, also I use my own homegrown <laughs> JavaScript shader editor uh, called shader.place. What motivated you to build your own tool? So it was really teaching during the pandemic that motivated me to build Shader Place. So what Shader Place is, is that it is a collaborative code editor and it's kind of like a Google Doc for a shader. Um, you can both be on the same page and edit the shader at the same time. And if it can compile, it will. And if it won't, it will just default to the last shader that could compile. Um, and it's try it tries to compile every single time there's like a change in the document. And so it's kind of like, in a way, it's like the ultimate compression algorithm because I was teaching shaders uh, over like Zoom or whatever, and I'd share my screen and like it would just be like compressing the hell out of it. And I'd be like, okay, everyone, this looks like, this looks really bad, but trust me, it's really, really sick. It's <laughs> like, this is a sick shader right here. Um, and and I was getting kind of frustrated and also like the frame rate wasn't good because a lot of interesting visualizations from shaders comes from its smooth, like its use of like smooth time so that it smoothly moves, but you know, the frame rate chopped that off. And so I thought it would be way less work to just send each other the code and then to have it render locally on our machines. And so that's what I did. And that's what shader place allows for. And it also allows um, just for like really fun remote collaboration as well. Or even like if you're in the same room to just kind of be like on your own computers working on a shader together. I saw that a lot of your performances are with another person. Um, can you talk about like, how does that work? What are the, the two of you doing? How do you communicate? That sort of thing. Ah, yes. So um, I usually collaborate with a audio live coder, a musician. We're, I, I collaborate closely with uh, specifically uh, Dan Gorelick. We have like a lot of performances. Uh, we've been doing a lot of performances over the pandemic. And I'm actually, this is his microphone. <laughs> so thanks. Shout out, Dan. And he will write title cycles code and I will write GLSL code. And then because we're both creative technologists, we can do things like have him send me a... For example, like one performance we did, we had him use a te text to speech voice to say words, and then he sent those words to me, and I was able to like render them in the visuals. So we had this like, oh, it, we hear the word and we see the word, um, and it's being used as a musical component and a visual component as well, uh, like for as in the performance. Other other collaborations I've done, um, I've worked with Danielle Rager. She's a computational neuroscientist and live coder and performer. And we or if like a, or if one voice, so she would send me like the MIDI of her of her music, and I would use that MIDI input, so that MIDI signal to then have different features of the visuals kind of come up. And I think that this is a very 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 unique thing. Well, not very. I guess it's like a unique thing of like having programmers be able to make music and visuals is that we can um, t have our programs talk to each other in really convoluted ways. It, basically, every single time I do anything that's kind of like outside of like, oh, you just have your fast forward transform like bind um, audio audio spectrum in and then you just do stuff based on that. It's always like, you know, you you route it through like you send it through like MIDI to Jack, then Jack to like OSC and then OSC sends it through spout and then spout sends it, you know, it's all these like crazy tool chains, but it gets the job done. <laughs> How much of your time is just like 
getting the tool chain to work. Oh my gosh. Uh, ver- versus like kind of actually doing the thing that you're trying to do. I'd say it's getting smaller and smaller. <laughs> like before, like when I was first doing this, I started live coding in like, yeah, like 2017. You know, most of the time would go to, you know, you're building your tool chain, building your communication system, your tools. But now I'd say it's like maybe like 30, 30% if I had to slap a number up there. Um, and it, it, it gets more if I try to do something different. So like I'm doing this collaboration with DJ Dave. She's like the reason that if I say live coding, some people will be like, oh, I know what that is because she's like, she's just really explaining it and like kind of showing it, showing it on TikTok. And so if, you're, if people are on like that world of TikTok, they might know. But I'm working with her to create a, like an ASCII art, uh, ASCII art visual set that corresponds with her audio code. So she's she's coding in Sonic Pi and I'm going to be coding the visuals and then the ASCII art is going to be overlaid on top of her of her code to kind of like be like embellishments but also kind of like merge the two and create a visual landscape like that. Oh, that sounds so cool. I I look forward to seeing it. So so you said like it's it's gotten faster to do the tool chain part. Mm-hmm. Is this just because like you've gotten more comfortable with your tools or have you sort of like developed a library of things that you can compose together or have have the tools just improved so it like can abstract away some of the complexity? I'd really say both. So the more people that are getting into live coding, the more they realize how things are kind of broken and they, you know, they'll create tools to fix it. So at this point, I feel like it's a cross between I'm standing on the shoulders of giants, but also I've been kind of working with these tools for, for a while, especially as a creative technologist beforehand. Getting things to talk to each other, I think, is most of the work of a creative technologist, including humans. <laughs> from poking around, um, I, I've never written a real shader, but from poking around, it looks like most of the tools are open source and like on GitHub. Is that a correct like view of it? Or are there like a lot of proprietary tools as well? I think there are a lot of proprietary tools just because like the, basically what I like shader coding is really ubiquitous. It's like everywhere. It's like, you know, people are always trying to find ways to like not shader code or to like make patches instead. Um, And so like a lot of times people don't know that they're coding shader code, but they actually are. So like any kind of like node programming language is like usually like kind of a shader code. You're being tricked into writing shader code. So there are a lot of proprietary like, uh, tool chains and algorithms and everything like that um, because it's like, you know, Epic Game Studio probably has like their own rendering engine and like, you know, any kind of like big, any like VR stuff, you need like your own rendering. And the, the first pixel shader, the first GPU, programmable GPU code was in 2001. And so people have been kind of hacking on this for like, you know, two two decades. So it's kind of at this point where that's just, there's a lot of open source stuff, which is awesome. And I'm so grateful for, I wouldn't have been even, even been able to get into it if it wasn't. And then there's also a lot of proprietary custom software that's, that's used in like studios and stuff like that. Gotcha. Uh, would you, do you use any proprietary tools yourself? Well, yeah, I think Code Life. Code Life is closed source. Yeah, but they're, that's like, it's like written by two people though. So it's not like a super like, it's written by one person and then I think there's another person on the team. I'm like, you know, I'm, I'm happy that they're getting paid for their work in a way. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Yeah, there's a very complex balance there between like the the, the beauties of open source and also the beauties of being able to pay rent. <laughs> um, how, how do you approach practice? Lots, lots of my practices is kind of like built around collaboration. And also like another th- cool thing... <laughs> about live coding and maybe (laughs) is that it kind of is like I kind of practice while I'm doing it and and I do like a lot of shows and I do a lot of quick iterations and maybe this makes my artwork cheaper but like I don't care um and so like a lot of times like I'll have like you know three three shows in one week and then I'll just do the shows and then that's my my practice (laughs) Um, and so I practice in in front of folks (laughs) <laughs> and I and I kind of like that. I kind of like having the process of what I do be so public. And it kind of, it does kind of make it such that like I have like a particular shapes that I end up using a lot because like, you know, it's just a lot of times I'll, I'll like write a shader and then I'll use that shader as the start as the, of the next performance. And so it's this kind of like ongoing ever evolving shader, kind of like the forever soup. <laughs> you know, you know that concept of like this, the forever soup. No, I don't think so. 
So it's basically like you have, you make a soup and then, and then you like eat part of it and then the leftovers and you just use the leftovers in the next soup and then it just keeps going on and on and on and on and on. And I think that's like, I mean, you could only do it for so long because it's like, it's food. Um, but I think there's like some cases where with like fermented things, like, you know, like mothers of, what are they called? Like the mother of, of kombucha. The gooey thing. The gooey yeah. thing. Yes. The gooey mother <laughs> that you just kind of keep it alive and you, and you use it again and again and again. And as you use it, it transforms into this other thing to make new things. And so I think that's another great analogy of like cooking. This is making me, we're going to, I'm going to have to like, I want to make like a fun shader cooking meal after this. <laughs> I looked it up. It's called a SCOBY. A SCOBY. Yes. <laughs> so it's like my, I have my like SCOBY shader that I, that I evolve and I kind of have that be part of my performance in my practice. <laughs> what you're saying about practicing live in front of an audience sounds really similar to how comedians often uh, prepare ah, their, their, yes. their stand up. Um, they certainly do a lot of prep beforehand, like, but before they get on stage, but then the refining and like making it really funny and, and perfecting the, the the punchlines often comes by like standing up in front of people and getting the feedback of like, well, did they laugh? And if they didn't laugh, that, that means you should probably change something. Yeah. Or maybe they laughed at a part you didn't expect. And so maybe you like sort of emphasize that part more in the next one. Last time I was in New York, I, I'm really into stand up. And last time I was in New York, I, I went to like five stand up shows in a week. And it was interesting because a few of the performers were on like multiple nights. And so I was able to see their, their st- uh, sets three different times. And um, it was like really interesting to see how they had the, almost the same set, but then they would like change the order of things or they would like add a joke here or remove a joke there uh, or call in the audience a little bit more. And it was like really cool to be able to compare and contrast the, the different sets that they had. I love that. Stand up is something that terrifies me. And it's so initially I'm extremely drawn to it. <laughs> well, it sounds like uh, you, you have a penchant for that sort of thing. Uh, get, getting on roller coasters, doing live coding and, and uh, stand up maybe is the next thing. Yeah, we'll see. <laughs> so how, how is uh, practicing live coding different from practicing with a, a more traditional instrument like a violin or a saxophone or, or something like that? I, that's a hard question. I, I really would love to ask a musician. <laughs> um, I mean, I, I practice guitar every day, and I, so I, I have opinions, but this, I'm very nascent in my musical journey. Um, and so far, I really have been like applying the kind of the same thing to it, where like sometimes you, you like to go back to your classics and like revisit, you know, the, the kind of like, <laughs> like, you know, cat power songs that you learned when you were in high school. And and, you know, compare that to where you are now, but then also like to learn how to like jam and to improvise is very difficult in an ongoing process. And that's definitely something that I saw with my coding too, is that like I would like when I first started. So with live coding, a lot of people think that you're always starting from scratch and you will code just from your brain, nothing else, no notes, no nothing, which is a style of live coding we have been calling that Mexico City style live coding. I'm not sure. I think maybe it was just like one time there was like a show like that in Mexico City. And now it's just, that's just called Mexico City, Mexico, Mexico City style live coding. So if there's anyone who's there who's into the live coding scene, I'm sorry if that's wrong. But most of the time when I do coding, if, if it's not like sprung upon me and like someone's like just gives me a computer and they're like, here, code, um, I will start from, I will have something to start from. And the same way that like, you know, when you're practicing, your instrument like maybe you just like performing in certain octaves or you have something to start off of and then you you have like your favorite chord structures that you go back to but then you kind of iterate from there so very very similar in that way yeah that makes sense you mentioned the the mexico city style what how does the culture of live coding differ in different cities around the world oh my god it's so cool so where it originated in like Oh my God, there's so much history too. I'm, I'm like a history nerd when it comes to this. In the UK, in uh, Sh- I think Sheffield is like where it kind of originated with like folks like Alex McLean and um, Hello Cat Food and uh, Shelley Knotts. Um, those folks over there, they have a much more like academic approach to it. So they'll, they'll, they can talk a lot about the interaction of the computer and the human as they collaborate together to come together to create a new form. And they have 
beautiful words about it. And I went to a live coding conference in uh, uh, Ireland and I got to meet all those folks. And it was really, really cool seeing them be, be into it, into like the academic side of live coding. Uh, and then like in New York, we're kind of like, bah! like, what is, what even is live coding? Like we have people doing modular synths. We consider a uh, modular synth live coding, even though, you know, I'm sure some people wouldn't, we consider node programming live coding. We consider even just like, we have like just DJs who just have computer aesthetic. We let them, in. <laughs> we invite them, not even let them, we invite them to our shows, um, and to perform. Uh, and so we're, we're kind of like all over the place, super colorful, super like, Dan- also like very like like we kind of ha- also have like raves like algo raves we're emphasis on the rave part i guess <laughs> and then gosh there's so it's, it's it's really a global phenomenon it's really interesting in california there's the av club and folks over here are really a lot about they use a lot of different like tool chainings and and interesting app applications of like their own uh, homegrown software. So that's also something I think that's ubiquitous. Everyone always ends up making their own tool in live coding, which is the inevitable kind of like uh, ending part of it because everyone just has, as you use other people's tools, you have ideas on how to create your own. There's also a scene in India of life coding. And from what I can see from here, that's like also very like education oriented and like learning, learning how to code through like education or rather through life coding um, there's this artist, Computational Mama. I, I know her. She she goes by Computational Mama online. I haven't met her in person, so I don't know her name. Um, but she, she's she been, like, teaching, like, P5 and, like, all this other cool stuff and is involved in the community over there. Yeah, there's it, it, it's it's all over. I love it so much. What is P5? Oh, P5. It's a JavaScript, uh, visual JavaScript language. So it's a wrapper to create elements on the HTML5 canvas. And it also allows, it's a whole world. So it also allows you to get like time input really quickly to be able to like get pictures. It's kind of like processing. I don't know if you know processing. Oh yeah, I I haven't really used it, but uh, I I think I have it starred on GitHub. (laughs) Exactly, perfect. Yeah, so it's it's processing, but for JavaScript instead of Java. So uh, live coding has is still, I think, pretty niche, but it seems to be getting like more and more popular. Uh, or maybe I'm just following more and more live coders and I'm speaking about my own experience. But um, as it moves more towards mainstream and more people get involved, how has the culture of the community changed? Oh my gosh. I Well, first, I super agree that live coding is like getting more and more popular. It's, it's, having, it's like having a moment. I'm actually on tour right now because I have a performance because all of these like kind of shows lined up on like this side of the United States and it's really amazing. This has never happened to me before, but it's definitely like because of this spreading of, of life coding, people are hearing about it and then they, you know, they'll reach out to me and I'll get shows or whatever. (laughs) Um, So it's definitely like, I think it's definitely growing and getting bigger. And you're saying you're to address your question of how the communities are changing because life code is growing it's really just getting more diverse and everyone has their different takes on it so like for example like uh dj dave who's the live coder that i'm touring with for part of it she works a lot with sampling um so she'll sample uh songs and she'll actually use live code to dj along with making her own music and her she makes like kind of like produced uh, music that is then like released on like Spotify and stuff like that. And uh, she'll record each component out of uh, Sonic Pi, which is a Ruby live coding framework to then give it to like a producer to then master it. So there's like, a, this is like the application of live coding as it is produced as, and then there's also people like Kingdom who will start from scratch, do it Mexico city style and like code, like break beats from, from scratch and, front of the audience yeah there's there's many different types of evolutions of live coding and I think that's the beautiful part is that everything that everyone brings to it is is equally valid and has its own special something to it when I was when I was TAing my the teacher that I was TAing for wouldn't let me help or he didn't ask me to help him grade because he knew that I would just be like they're all special snowflakes and they all get A's <laughs> and so that's what I'm kind of saying right now it's like I think it's everything that everyone makes is just going to be so beautiful and amazing it's very cool because you can then also incorporate techniques that you see other people using into your own music if, if it matches your vibe. Or you could just like enjoy it from afar if you're like, you know, that doesn't really work for what I'm trying to do, but 
but it's fun to see. Yeah, the community is so amazing in Life Code. Mm-hmm. Like, it's it's something that really kind of shrinks my global views because like I can go to like you know Argentina and like my friend Sol, even though our, our like our lives are very different, we all can just talk about life coding and 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 uh, relate on this very niche type of performance. And so everywhere I go, I know I'll have someone to nerd out about. <laughs> This question is more for me, but the audience might find it interesting too. Um, for some background, my my boyfriend is from Argentina, so I spend a lot of time there every year. Uh, I'm curious, like, what is the live coding scene like in, in Argentina and how, how do they approach it differently? Oh, gosh. I wish – I only know if a few people – uh, in Argentina who are doing it, but it seems, so my friend Sol does it and she is like hardcore, like math major. And she writes fractals and, uh, f- feedback systems. And I think that from, from what I know, it's, it's, it's a lot of like using lots of cool math, <laughs> but maybe that's just my, my friends that are there who are, who are into it. Oh, and she, she's in like a band called like, I think they call like three amigos or th- Maybe that's in Spanish, but it's just like three friends and, uh, and they have like audiovisual performances over there. I could, I could, I'll send you her, her stuff. I would love to see it. If, and if she does in-person performances, like maybe next time I'm in Buenos Aires, I'll, I'll go watch it. it. Sounds really fun. Um, I, I imagine your ability to do in-person performances was curtailed during the lockdowns at the beginning of the pandemic. How, how did you adapt your work to those constraints? And are there any techniques that you picked up during that time? that you've carried forward now that in-person performances are back? The, the biggest challenge for streaming was the combination of a visualists and the musician's code, because you want to be able to see both. And so basically, I just kind of like refined my tool set of being able to combine both both pieces of code into one output stream so that you know you can send it to like Twitch or whatever. And really it is it's a lot of like OBS magic. So I learned OBS a lot over the pandemic. And OBS Ninja, which is a really it's just actually a different tool, but it's basically does the same thing, but it's like online. And I'm definitely gonna use that a lot a lot more because it, it reduce it makes everything so much easier when you just have one output stream. You can like mirror that on projectors um, and you know use like HDMI splitters to just kind of like have that be a really quick a uh, way to s- slap up some code up there. Oh, interesting. So I- if I'm understanding right, like before you would have two streams of data, one for the audio and one for the visuals, and then you had to do some like complex stuff, but that that wasn't really possible when you were streaming. So you like learned how to do a more simple, like elegant way to do it that will also be useful for... Exactly. Yeah. Yeah. It puts... It puts more of the work onto the computer and less work onto like the people setting up projectors and wiring and stuff like that. That is always nice. Uh, that's that's a large part of what computers are good at. So, Exactly. Before this interview, you sent me a link to toplap.org. I hope I'm saying that right. Uh, and it's an organization that promotes live coding and it stands for the Temporary Organization for the Pragmatics of Live Art Programming. And that name made me very curious. I, I was wondering, like, why is the word temporary in there? And like, what does that say about the culture of the people who, who started it? We all embrace the ephemerality, even our manifesto. So the kind of thing that's like supposed to bring us together, we call it the live coding manifesto draft. And it will always be a draft. It's never going to be the final version because everything is always constantly being edited. And I think that that's why it's like temporary organization because we just like everything is is always changing. That's the one thing that is um, for sh- you know for sure in life is change. Um, and I think <laughs> that also like kind of bleeds it. Maybe it's just because I'm like in California and I'm in this kind of like woo woo like co op, and it really like bleeds into like my meditation practice of like you know Anicca, everything is always going to change, and that's the only thing that you can kind of be sure of. (laughs) So it's like, kind of like, I don't know, I guess that's my take on that right now. It's pretty hard to to argue with that. Why do you think live coders embrace that and like highlight that fact? Because I I don't know if I've ever heard of an organization that was like officially called the temporary organization for blah, blah, blah. Oh my gosh. I think that's so smart to do, especially with computers, to just embrace the fact that it is going to you know, everything is going to end at some point. And just to be prepared for that, especially because computers are like ever changing objects and like any type of any new media artist knows a big pain point is just keeping your artwork alive online. So like, you know, like when Flash was deprecated, like a whole era of artwork is just gone. 
And I think just coming forth, coming, embracing that forthright is that everything is, is changing and all your tools are going to break and eventually degrade. Even like the disks on hard drives are eventually going to fail. They actually last a shorter amount of time than print. So it's like all of the code that we write is actually going to last a shorter amount of time than if you were to write your code out on a piece of paper. <laughs> That's really interesting. Yeah. Uh, have you been to the Internet Archive in San Francisco? I haven't been, but I have a friend who works there. Yeah, they, they talk a lot about this and like, you know, they're, they're trying to um, slow down that process to the extent possible and save things that are digital. But I, I whenever I hear people there talk about it, I, I get a sense that they understand that it will probably happen one day. Um, uh, but let's like, at least to the extent possible, hold on to things. Exactly. I feel I feel that very strongly. And also like it, just like embracing it. And saying, like, this isn't going to last forever. I'm not going to last forever. Well, that's a good transition into another topic I wanted to cover, which uh, something that seems to last forever is email. And <laughs> uh, it's been around for a very long time in, in Internet age, at least. And that's something that you've done a lot of research on. Something something I saw that you had written was that you, you think that email is, like, very radical. C- can you share why you think email is radical? Email is and extremely the distribution metal. of it and the decentralization of it. If you like really think about it, it's it's like everything that like every like radical new protocol wants to be. It's already just like built in. So email was made in the seventies and it's not going anywhere. It's basically our digital passports, and it's a you know decentralized write only uh, protocol. I find email interesting because I realize that it's the only long distance form of communication that I use every day that doesn't necessarily have to rely on a big tech company or the government, like including, you know, like snail mail, email, it doesn't, it it essentially is a protocol that can be written by really anyone, but it also like, there's a lot of, um, I guess, barriers into learning how to set up an email server, but essentially at its core, it can be, uh, it really is like this kind of democratized protocol I, I, I was thinking about this and I was like, oh, wow, I, like, I was thinking about how cool email is and why do we hate it so much? And like, why is this email this thing that we turn into something that like, you know, we, we kind of regret it every day? And I was thinking about like, how, how can I share my, my love of email to other people? And I thought about making this email server so that A, I could learn more about email and like the difficulties of setting up your own email server. And also to kind of spread like, just, just just, awareness of what email is and how it exists and the history of it. So I came up with this uh, email server called Computer Faith. Um, and basically it's like running on a server that's, that's, you know, it's not run by Google or Amazon or any kind of big tech company. It is a mischievous email server <laughs> in that if you use it to send email, it will kind of scramble your words, whether it be like using a dictionary to like replace some words or like just scramble it, translate it into another language and translate it back. Um, but basically it is bringing faith, like, like having faith back into like a type of, into technology. Because I was thinking about like, what are the things that are like hot in technology? You know, you have like Bitcoin's really hot. We have like 3D printing is really, <laughs> I mean, 3D printing is less hot now like 3D printing and machine learning, all three of those things are like extremely like hot topics, right? And like the thing that kind of intersects all of them is uncertainty, right? You don't know if your 3D print is going to go haywire. You don't know if your machine learning is going to misidentify a duck for a car (laughs) or you don't know if like Bitcoin's going to go down. Um, And so I was like, yeah, what if I just made email like as risky as, as all of these hot technologies? And that's where that's where I started making computer faith. That was my really scrambled way of describing how excited I am about email. No, I mean it's one of those things where like I think it's one of the few types of identification that everyone I've ever met has. Like I, I guess I haven't asked every single person I've met, but you know, almost everyone has a phone number, and almost everyone has an email, almost everyone has a name, mm-hmm. and that's about it. You know? Like, yeah. It's, uh, <laughs> yeah. Do you remember what your first email address was? Um, it was just. Devin at Zoogle.us, uh, which is like my fam- my family's email server. Whoa, wait, your family had an email server? Yeah, my dad set one up when I was a kid. Um, I should That's actually so ask him cool. why. I don't know why he did it in Russia. Like, I don't think he had any particular reason for it besides just wanting it to be his. Oh, I love that. 
my first email address was kangagoo too, because because kangagoo was taken, and so I was like, I guess I just have to be kangagoo too. <laughs> I was always really, um, really jealous of my friend Anna. Her her email address was. I hope that no one sends her a ton of spam. Now that I'm saying it, but it was her last name was Goldberg, and so hers was horsing around at the goldbergs.com or uh, at, at, yeah like and the the at sign was like you know used like horsing around at i thought oh. that was just the most <laughs> clever thing i've ever seen i thought she was a genius there there is something that i started doing so in my research in email i was just like reading like the rt i mean rf C, which stands for request for comments. And it's kind of just like internet protocols are just put on RFCs um, just for f- maybe there's people who are listening who don't know. Basically, if you add like a, like a plus at the end of your, of your email uh, before the at sign, so after your, your name and before the at sign, you can add plus and then you can write anything you want. So you can perhaps say who you gave your email address to when you gave it to them. So like, you know, if I'm signing up for a service, I'll just put plus and then the name of the service. So then if I get spam email from that e- to that email, I know who leaked. I have also been using it as like a small diary. So you can say like, you know, a contact plus um, feeling good today at charstyles.com. So that, you know, when I get an email from there, I'm like, oh yeah, it's like a little remembering of when I got, when I felt good. That, that's super cute. I had not thought of using that as a diary. I like that idea. Something you say on your personal website is that part of your interest in email is that there's a, you, you want to call people to value maintenance over invention because maintenance itself can be innovative. Can you speak a little bit to that and like how that relates to email? Oh my gosh, yes. So I always say that like, you know, always this like constant technology to reinvent like buses or, you know, to reinvent kind of things that already exist is kind of getting boring. (laughs) And I say that with a wink. (laughs) It's getting wink boring because, you know, like people like Elon Musk and his boring company, like that is just like, to me, I'm just like, that's just kind of like your default go-to to to kind of grab for power or something like that. When in reality, there are are all these structures in place that if you, you know, have, have respect for previous thinkers and, you know, are people who've who've come before this before us you can say like oh they've you know they've thought about this for a long time and kind of building on top of that instead of us you know starting from scratch because in a way like you can still start from scratch but still use a lot of infrastructure that's already in place that works for people it's really just being like mindful about i guess tech mindful about how you use technology and also respectful for of the past (laughs) i think that that can go a long way what does it look like for a technologist to emphasize maintenance? Like what, what sorts of actions would you take in your day-to-day life to, to try to, to follow that value? Allocating time to learn. Um, I mean, we, we all do this in a way, but just kind of, I guess, making like a ritual out of it to, to learn the, about the past for to respect the past in a way. I say this, but I, I also, it's one of the reasons why I'm not so much a web developer because web development is like, there's, you have to learn so much about the past. It can get kind of like overwhelming as opposed to learning about, you know, something like a native app or C++. Not that C++ is like less work than learning JavaScript, but just in my brain, it's, you have to learn less about the history of protocols, why things, they are like this as opposed to web development. I guess that, that's not a very great answer, but alas, <laughs> I guess I don't have a great answer for that. No, I think there's something to that. I mean, one of um, one of my big experiences when I worked uh, as a full time software engineer was like whenever I'd come up to a new system, I'd be like, okay, I think we should just rewrite it, and you know, because then I'll understand it. And, and like, this is a terrible idea for like a lot of reasons. Sometimes rewrites are a good idea, but very rarely. And I, the reason it there's that mismatch, I think, is because like. A lot of people, myself included, will go up to a system that you don't understand yet and you go, well, you know, this doesn't, the reason I can't understand it is because it's bad <laughs> and it's not me that is lazy and doesn't want to learn it. It's it's like, it's there must be something wrong. So we're going to start from scratch and there's a time and place for that sometimes, but most of the time I think it's important to step back and be like, okay, maybe there is some reason to this. Maybe I'm going to just make the same mistakes as what they made or worse ones. So let me like sit and understand it before I like have really strong opinions about how it should be different. Yeah, I I agree with that. 
And, but I, I also do see the value of like rewriting stuff. I think on like a micro, I think on a micro scale, like that's, that's okay. But on like a macro scale of like, of like, you know, when people have a bunch of power, when people have a bunch of power and like, you know, and they're, they're making these grand decisions about like infrastructure and, um, you know, technology and stuff going forward. I think that that is when it's, you know, there should be like more thought and like respect for the past. But like, you know, if you're trying to get like something done, like I, I always, I rewrite things a lot. I even like rewrite my own, my own stuff sometimes. Cause like, when you rewrite it, you like learn it different way. Can you, can you say a little bit more about that? Like uh, examples that come to mind? Yeah, I guess like the example is just the like, canonical example. I might, I like alluded this to this before. It's just like Elon Musk, like reinventing buses and being like, yeah, I need a way like humans cannot humans cannot, no human can defeat traffic. And it's a, it is a universal problem that no human can defeat traffic and all that. And someone like, you know, it's just kind of like, Elon, that's a bus. You know, it's a, it's a bus, man. It's not like, it's not fancy. It's not sexy, but it's, it's there. And like, there's, you know, there's solutions to this. If you take a more like community centered approach to solving problems, I guess I'm kind of getting into like, I'm still, yeah, I'm still, I guess I'm getting kind of into like my political framework of reference. (laughs) For sure. In 2019, you did this really cool project called Empathy Machine, uh, where you worked with dancers and like had a a ring. Can you, can you describe that project and the tools that you used to, to build it? Yes. So that was with uh, a dance crew, Slow Danger, and they were creating a dance piece that was about the kind of relationship to technology and almost technology and mass hysteria of People. So specifically referencing the uh, Y2K hysteria <laughs> that happened, um, they uh, created a dance piece to kind of to, like create conversations around that. And they um, hired me and one other technologist, uh, Neil Henke, to create a system that would actually add light as a collaborator in their dance so their shadows and and like a moving spotlight and what that is in materiality to let me i can paint a picture is that it's about a, an led ring that is 12 feet in diameter and it is uh above the dancers and this these are addressable leds and so you can kind of create a light that that moves around the space you can kind of create like a fluctuating noise that Uh, or have multiple light sources. This is not the first time that people have used light in dance, but um, it was a a fun way to to create a living and very transportable. That was another thing. It was very transportable, so we could travel with it a lot. <laughs> light, light installation that the dancers could could dance under, and it was it was extremely DIY as well. And I wrote software to address the LEDs, uh, and I added a camera in the center so that it would respond to the dancers uh, in real time. So if someone was like, you know, the, the light could be where they were dancing, so they could improv and have the light follow them. Or the light could be, you know, opposite from where they're dancing. Or the lights, the lights features could be corresponded to their location or how they were moving. I used um, ML4A, which is a Open Frameworks plugin that allowed easy access to machine learning algorithms for artists to use. And so I had uh, used a classifier. It was a simple classifier, but to then interpolate between different dance movements or dance formations that the dancer would create. So the one lighting structure would correspond to them all standing and then, you know, what different lighting structure would correspond to them all like sitting on the ground. Um, And that was a really fun process because of the way that you need to teach the machine to create the data set. That's one thing that's always, (laughs) I kind of love doing in machine learning is creating the data set is that I just had the dancers kind of like you know, stand, stand in all different ways that they possibly could stand with all these different lighting conditions. And, it was, and they were like, you know, it was a meditation on standing and a meditation on like sitting and doing all their different formations. And I think that those, I really live for those interactions with technology when I do my work. That's really cool. Cause I, I think that uh, when I took like a machine learning class in college, it was very much framed as like the algorithm is the cool part. And then the data is like, the hard, annoying work that you have to do to collect to make it work. But, you you know, none of the, like, programmers are really, like, excited about that part. It's just kind of something you have to do. And so it's fun to flip that on its head and be like, no, that's actually the, that's 
the interesting part where all the all the magic is really happening. Exactly. And I think this idea that that is like the annoying part is what leads to all of these people trying to siphon data from people who don't consent to having their data inside of a machine learning algorithm because that this is just seen as like the boring part or like the tedious work or like, you know, something like that. It just leads to people being like, I don't know, I think like more intentional data collection and consensual data collection is a beautiful part of machine learning. What are existing systems that like someone might have come across in day-to-day life that you would do the data collection for differently? Oh my gosh, this is a really great loop back. So to, to a previous topic, email. So a lot of natural language processing models and any type of, I guess, model that's that needs a large text input have connections to what is known as the Enron data set. So with the Enron, have you heard of this? I have, but, but, but go on. This is really good stuff. It is really good. So the Enron data set is emails that was released from a, I think it's like a, a, it was some kind of power company. Do you know what kind of company Enron was? It was like oil and gas or something like that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So this oil and gas company was put on trial for a bunch of like illegal, like embezzlement or like, uh, like tax fraud, basically like really like white collar crimes, malpractice. Um, And because they were put on trial, their entire email communication systems was released to the public because like that was like evidence. And because, because these, these emails were this massive, like, you know, data set of, of communication was released to the public opportune machine uh, learning scientists would saw that as something that could be used to train their network. But then it brings this question of you're training a network on a company that was committing fraud. <laughs> and not, not that everyone in the company was, was doing that, but it, you know, this talk, you could talk, we could talk a long time about like company culture and like how that kind of, you know, changes, it changes people in a way. And so, you know, it kind of brings the question of, of like this, this data set is now leached into all sorts of technology that we use today. The same way that like, you know, if you were to like use like a weird onion, like three months ago in your forever soup, that would still be in your soup, you know, three months or the essence of that somehow would still be in your soup later on because you like use that. But it's like, it's honestly, it's like Enron is like, it's like everywhere. And so that, that is an example of, of like, a way that data collection is kind of has some, I mean, we don't actually can't even track that down the unintended consequences of, of that, but it just makes calls to question of like intentional data collection, like what is intentional data collecting and should stuff like that be, be used? Yeah. Especially if it's like overrepresented, it's one thing to pull data that is sort of like a representation of all human activity. And one of those things is fraud, but it's another thing if, like, one of the main it's sources of... Yeah. 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 <laughs> <laughs> kind of wild. Do you remember, like, what, what they were on trial for? Was it... I think it was fraud or... It was for their bookkeeping. Yeah, it was for fraud. Uh, they, 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 like, lied about exactly kind of like how much losing money and they were, like, about to go bankrupt or something. So not only were they making less money, it was, like, they were, like, a completely unsustainable business. I think there were other sketchy things going on, too. But that was, I believe, the one that they like got nailed for. <laughs> There's actually a really good documentary on Netflix, as a side note, that is qu- quite interesting. So when you were building the empathy machine with this with this dance troupe, I heard that the, the ML system broke part of the way through. And you had advocated for like keeping it in the show and embracing any mishaps, which feels very in line with a lot of the other things that you said before. Can you say more about like why you wanted to do that and like what you think would have happened? It always, because machine learning is this black box, it always has unexpected kind of results happen. And, and I really like the way that dancers can adapt. And that's kind of what dancers are really best at, making something beautiful out of part, part of a mistake. Or not a mistake, yeah, like a computer's, a computer's mistake. They can work with that and adapt to that and create something beautiful out of it. I'm not sure if that answers your question. No, no, that, that, that's, a good, that's a good answer. <laughs> Most programming today is done through a keyboard. And that's true of most live coding as well, as far as I understand. 
If you were to create a novel input device specifically designed for your performances, how would it work? I would love to embody my performance in in a, in a different way. One thing I've been doing a lot recently is aerial silks. And I would love to kind of be able to be up in the air and live coding somehow. Maybe that'd be through movements. Maybe like there would be like some keyboard involved, but I would love to kind of be like a, a hybrid, like, you know, maybe I'm suspended with the keyboard and ha- also have keyboard like embedded in the silks. <laughs> it's kind of like a, like a crazy dream that I, that I want to do before, before I die. <laughs> And when you say aerial silks, you're talking about like the circus silks where you're like up in the air. Yeah, exactly. Cool. Have you have you heard of um I think they're pronounced Mimu gloves or Mi- Mimu, I'm not sure. Is it like the Maya armband or no? I haven't heard of that one. Um but like all I know is I saw this video a while back of Ariana Grande um with like these gloves on where uh, you can like change the volume of the music. And I think like your finger, it like follows your fingers to do cool things. And um, it sounds, it's not exactly what you were describing, but it's like the closest thing I've ever yeah. seen to, no, to I what you were describing. No, I think that's really close. Uh, it's like the, you know, like Imogen Heap has those, has the gloves that she performs with a lot of times. Yeah, yeah. I think these are actually exactly the same gloves. I think like, like that would be really cool. So, yeah, something like that. I just, I think I'm just, I'm always thinking about like my, my physical practice and how I can integrate that into my like computational practice. My biggest dream is to bring machine or room sized computers back. <laughs> like I want to be able to run, to run across the room to have to hit enter and for there to be just like a giant lever that I, that I have to press to, to run my program. I know this is like the exact opposite of where computers are going. I really believe in like the importance of embodiment and knowledge that is stored in different parts of the body. And I don't know if this is like the way to do it, but it's just kind of like a dream that I have. I think a lot of people share that intuition actually. Like, I mean, you know, have you ever seen Iron Man and how like uh, he's got like all the different displays around him and he like uses his hands and stuff. Um, I think that's like a very... It, it just looks cool. That's part of it. But like, I think one of the reasons it looks cool is you're feeling like you're really part of the system as opposed to kind of like outside of the system looking in through a tiny little window. Exactly. Yeah. And you just have like little sticks that you're trying to put together. It's like a ship in a bottle. Yeah. I like that metaphor a lot. Okay. So n- now I will have to introduce you to Omar when you're back in New York, the oh, friend that I yes. mentioned at the beginning, because he, he does like a lot of work in this, in this realm. Um, if you were to use those gloves, how do you think it would influence your, the result of your music and the result of, of the, the visuals on the screen? Ah, I think that, gosh, it would be a lot more organic. So there would be a lot more like um, less sine waves because that's the way that I create movement in in a shader is that you just kind of put time like sign of time sign of time and then it's this perfect like oscillation so but if i have movement that's input you know correspondence to like me there would be a lot more like randomness and kind of like human movements that our brains can pick up like you know because we have like certain neurons to like detect things that like you know we we relate to um whether it be like our movements or our faces and so it would definitely like if it would definitely feel more human. One th- one artist that I really like is our group of artists is Team Raffles, and they do like VR performances, but they use the VR controllers to like hand to create like a handheld kind of camera uh, like aspect. And I think that that is a really beautiful, <laughs> beautiful. It's they're they're super like uh, chaotic and like maximalist. Um, but the, the, the way that they use human input and mocap in their work is really inspiring. So I think that it would probably. So I I have one last question, which is, uh, what are some ways that you have misused technology? Ah, I have misused technology all my life. So I'm very delighted to be asked this question. Most of the time, my misuse of technology is when I'm writing shader code, I will, have a mistake, something that I didn't intend, but I'll lean into that mistake and create something that is beautiful and something that I love more than I would intentionally have intended on doing. I always say that if Bob Ross was a programmer, I sincerely believe he would be a shader programmer 
because your mistakes are so beautiful and any type of and I, I haven't really come across that in any other type of computing where especially in, in all graphics really um, graphics programming your outputs can be so visually compelling or your mistakes can be so visually compelling and like even even brings humor to it like I what was one of the reasons why I got into graphics programming was just because the glitches oh my gosh they bring me so much joy like uh, like a you know a character t posing off into the sunset um while their triangle spaz out that just is like the pinnacle of 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 comedy maybe that's why i couldn't be a comedian because i would just be talking about <laughs> i would just be talking about like uh, graphics glitches because that just brings me so much joy other ways i misuse technology is other ways I misuse technology is in trying to unravel it to talk about how it works. So I misuse email by talk by creating a broken email server uh, because I want to learn about it. So like breaking something to learn about it, I think is really important and a part of also like a part of play too. I believe in a huge importance of like play and in, in learning how to program. Does that? Is there any other like things that I should? That I'm forgetting. <laughs> I know you, you did such great research, by the way. I loved all the research that you did on me. This is a super delightful conversation. I've never had such a nice interview before. <laughs> oh, thank you. That makes me very happy to hear. It's um, it's easy to ask fun questions when I'm talking to someone who's done really interesting work. So it's it just kind of fl- flows out uh, to just uh, you know, basically I just like read something that you've written or watch something, and I'm like, okay, well now I have a bunch of questions, so I got to ask her those questions. Um, uh, but yes, that that does that. Those are great answers to the question. All right, so so those are all the questions that I had prepared. Um, Thank you so much for for coming on the show. This was such a fun conversation. Yes, I had so much fun. 